Hello everyone, I am Shivani and welcome to Aki Law, Know the Law. So in today's session, we are discussing about plaint. So in my sessions on the subject of drafting, pleading and conveyancing, uh, while I discussed the concept of pleading, I stated that pleadings is nothing but plaint and written statement. So pleadings is equal to plaint and written statement. So this is a well known fact which uh, we all know. If you've missed my videos on my sessions regarding to drafting, pleading and conveyancing, I have shared links of those videos in the description box below. Do watch them. So now today we are discussing specifically about plaint. So the very first question is, what is a plaint? So plaint is a document for instituting a suit in the proper court of law. A civil suit shall be instituted by presenting a plaint to the court. So let's now draw the key points for the meaning of plaint. So right now I stated the meaning of plaint. So what are the key points which will help you in better understanding of and also to uh, remember the concept of plaint. So let's divide this meaning into three parts. So the first part is plaint is a document. Document for what? For instituting a suit. Where? So this suit shall be uh, instituted in the proper court of law. So first is plaint is a document. For what? For instituting a suit. And where? In the proper court of law. That's it. This is what plaint is all about. Now, now let us discuss what is the provision under law for plaint. So order 7 rule 1 of the code of civil procedure of 1908 provides that the plaint shall contain the following particulars. So this is the list of particulars. So A name of the court in which the suit is brought. B name, description and place of resident of plaintiff. C. Name, description and place of resident of, re, sorry, residence of defendant so far as they can be ascertained. D. If the plaintiff or defendant is a minor or a person of unsound mind, a statement to that effect. E. Facts constituting cause of action and when it arose. F. Facts showing court has jurisdiction. G. Relief which the plaintiff claims. H. Plaintiff has allowed set off or relinquished a portion of his claim. Amount so allowed or relinquished. I. Statement of value of subject matter. Suit for the purpose of jurisdiction and of court fees so far as the court admits. So now let us discuss about the particulars of a plaint or what are the contents of a plaint. So it shall have details like first is the name of the court. Next is description of plaintiff. It shall then be followed by description of defendant. Then the statement of plaintiff or defendant uh, whether is a minor or of unsound mind. Then facts constituting the cause of action. It shall then be followed by description and details of subject matter. Next is the court's jurisdiction. Next is the relief claimed. Next the relinquished portion of claim. And last is the valuation of suit. So these are the essential contents of a plaint. So one must uh, file a plaint uh, as per the format that I have given right now. So these shall be the contents and requirements for a plaint to be filed before the court of law. So now let us discuss about the requirements of a plaint. Right now I discussed about the contents but what are the actual requirements of a plaint is what we will be discussing now. So uh, the first requirement is that the plaint shall contain name of the court. So for example, 
in the court of district judge at dash whatever city or place uh, where this plaint is to be filed or in the court of small causes at dash in the high court of judicature at dash or in the supreme court of india at new delhi so the second one uh, requirement is the plaint shall contain the name description and place of residence of the plaintiff so where there are more than one plaintiff the name and description of each plaintiff should be furnished so correct name description and address or place of residence should be stated otherwise this may create problem while issuing summons so accurate and proper valid address of the plaintiff or plaintiffs whatever the number of plaintiffs are are to be furnished properly in the plaint so that proper summons can be issued by the court so in uh, case of more than one plaintiff each concerned plaintiff should be give, uh, given so details regarding to those uh, all of those plaintiffs should be given and also should be consecutively numbered so 1 2 3 4 along with their complete and correct address so plaintiff number 1 plaintiff number 2 so they should be numbered all of their names age occupation and addresses and complete information should be provided next is a plaintiff should be very keen while deciding which party should be included as plaintiff and which shall be excluded so it is in the hand of hands of the plaintiff that he should decide that who should accompany him or who should be the one who should be uh, named as a plaintiff in that particular plaint and who is not to be mentioned as plaintiff in that particular plaint so he may at times exclude the necessary party and include the irrelevant one thus it is a responsibility of the plaintiff to choose the right parties to the suit so it is important that plaintiff should not make such a mistake of adding an irrelevant uh, plaintiff as a plaintiff in the plaint and to exclude the important plaintiff uh, from the plaint so he should be very uh, keen in understanding that who should be included and who should be excluded as plaintiff in the plaint so next is the plaint shall contain the name description and place of residence of the defendant so it is necessary to give the correct name description and address of the defendant as in the case of the plaintiff so same is the case uh, as it was in the uh, case of plaintiff that uh, uh, the entire name description address may be age occupation residential address the is to be provided of the defendants also so if the suit is instituted against a firm or a corporation having more than one persons person or persons the name description place of residence and also the place of business of the firm of or corporation is required to be given so where an individual is not concerned but the defendant is a corporation or a firm then the name description place of residence and the or the place of residence of the firm or corporation is to be furnished so like plaintiff the defendants who are more than one in numbers should be correctly named described and correct place of residence is required to be given so it is same as in the case of a plaint so the defendant should be numbered as 1 2 3 and 4 so defendant number 1 his name age occupation residential address same in case of 2 3 4 as many defendants are you are required to furnish entire information of each and every defendant so the next is about the description of parties so it shall include the name of father the age of person concerned and the correct postal address so as i said that it should contain name description and address so what does that description includes so it includes the name of the father it can uh, includes the age of the person who is concerned and also the correct postal address so the next element of a plaint is the facts constituting the cause of action so this is the most important part of a plaint so here you are required to write the facts of the case or matter so it is important to note that the date when the cause of action arose must invariably be given 
so separate paragraphs duly numbered should be provided for each material fact different facts should not be mixed up in same paragraph which may create confusion in the court the lack of material facts in the averments or statements in the plaint shall be enough to dismiss the suit as it does not disclose the cause of action so if no any cause of action has been mentioned in the plaint the suit shall be dismissed at the first instance so it's very important that whatever document you furnish you basically uh, i'm talking about plaint right now so it's important that material facts should be properly mentioned in the plaint otherwise the suit will be dismissed in the first instance so the date of the cause of action must be mentioned to establish that the suit is filed within the time limit which has been provided under the indian limitations act of 1963 so if such period is ex exceeded then necessary grounds are required to be mentioned so whatever time limit has been provided under the indian limitations act of 1963 one must fall within that limits and if uh, it does not fall in that limits or if that limit is exceeded and you have a proper substantial reason or ground for such a uh, delay such a cause should be mentioned so order 2 rule 2 of the code of civil procedure of 1908 stipulates that the whole claim in respect of the cause of action should be made in a suit and the plaintiff cannot choose to split up the claims in respect of the same cause of action by way of subsequent suits this is intended to avoid multiplicity of suits and restrict the unnecessary number of litigations so where there are number of facts or number of matters which have a similar cause of action one cannot file different uh, cases for the same cause of action so are required to furnish everything which is related to the same cause of action all the facts which are related to the same cause of action in the same single plaint so that uh, there it shall avoid multiplicity of uh, the litigations or the suits so if the plaintiff seeks the recovery of money the plaint should state the correct amount claimed so if there are any unsettled accounts between plaintiff and defendant the plaint shall contain approximate amount sued for if the subject matter is an immovable property a complete description of the same shall be contained in the plaint to identify it if proper details are not served with the court may ask to provide fuller and better particulars so where there is any kind of immovable property like it can be any land so you have to provide provide proper description uh, proper even measurements or costing or whatever it is landmarks of that particular immovable property in a proper format and if it is not furnished in a proper way or proper manner the court can ask for uh, to provide in a uh, fuller and better particulars re uh, relating to that immovable property also it is the duty of the pleader to ensure that the suit is instituted in the competent court having jurisdiction regarding the same so the court in which you file your plaint should have the jurisdiction to hear the matter so it should fall within the ambit of that particular court to hear that particular case thus it is an essential requirement that the plaint shall contain facts showing that the court has jurisdiction at the end the plaint shall contain the relief claimed by the plaintiff either simply or in the alternative so order 7 rule 7 of the code of civil procedure of 1908 thus states that the plaint shall contain or state specifically the relief which the plaintiff claims either simply or in the alternative and it shall not be necessary to ask for general or other relief which may always be given as the court may think just to the same extent as if it had take it had been asked for 
so uh, the above mentioned rule shall apply to both for the plaintiff's plaint as well as for the defendant's written statement so next is that the plaint shall specifically contain what the amount of relinquished portion of the claim of the plaintiff as has been provided under order 2 rule 1 of the code of civil procedure of 1908 so where the plaintiff himself relinquishes a portion of uh, the claim that he has made a specific mention regarding the same has to be made as has been complied under order 2 rule 1 of the code of civil procedure of 1908 so next is that the suit has to be valued for the purposes of pecuniary jurisdiction according to the market value of the subject matter of the suit the valuation in a suit does not take into consideration the territorial jurisdiction it is only meant for the sake of peculiar jurisdiction and the last part is regarding signing and verification so at the end of the plaint it should bear the signature of along with the verification of the parties concerned so it should be signed by the parties who are related to that particular matter also the plaint shall be considered as improper if it has not been signed or verified so where the signature is absent or no any signature has been made by the uh, plaintiff in the case of a plaint such plaint shall be considered improper for uh, not signing uh, of the plaint so yet another important part is about the structural format of a plaint so along with the substantive rules we will also understand about the structural format so how is the structure of a plaint so basically a plaint is divided into three portions so the first portion shall consist of the formal uh, uh, which is a formal portion so this formal portion includes the heading of the draft like for example in the high court of judicature of mumbai or whatever uh, state it is or uh, whichever high court it is now the second portion is the body of the plaint so this uh, portion can also be stated as the substantial portion as it contains the substance of the plaint it is called the substantial portion so it shall contain the actual body or the actual content of the draft which is divided into uh, paragraphs and such paragraphs are consecutively numbered so here the facts or uh, the later part that i have discussed earlier shall fall in that second portion that is the body of the plaint and the third part is the third portion which is the conclusive portion so this is the last portion of the uh, draft and it shall contain the signature and verification of the plaintiff and or the parties which are con- concerned to that particular plaint so this is what all uh, is all about plaint so we have discussed what a plaint is or what is the provision under law or we have also discussed about the particulars i have also uh, stated uh, rules regarding the same and what has been contained under um, the code of uh, civil procedure of 1908 and i have also discussed about the structural format of the plaint so how we can conclude so to conclude we can say that the plaint is a document for instituting a suit in the proper court of law it is very important document which is drafted by the pleader in consultation with his client a civil suit shall be instituted by presenting a plaint to the court the plaint is the basis of preferring one's claim in the court of law and hence it is very important document therefore before framing a plaint it is essential to ascertain as to what particulars are necessary to include so plaint is a very first uh, part of uh, a suit so the uh, more effective or the more precise concise and to the point your plaint is the more perfection you will gain in uh, presenting your uh, client before the court of law so whatever norms have been uh, provided for in uh, the procedural laws or whatever are the rules regarding to filing of a plaint 
वन मस्ट अबाइड बाय दोज रूल्स एंड प्रोविजन दैट हैव बीन प्रोवाइडेड एंड क्रिएट अ कंसाइज एंड प्रिसाइज फॉर्म ऑफ अ प्लेन विच विल अल्टीमेटली हेल्प इन इफेक्टिव एंड एफिशियंट प्लीडिंग्स बिफोर द कोर्ट ऑफ लॉ एंड विल अल्टीमेटली लीड टू गिविंग और सीकिंग फेवरेबल जजमेंट्स फॉर योर क्लाइंट सो दिस इज ऑल फॉर टूडे I hope that the information that I have provided to you is useful. Uh, see you in the next session. I hope you like my videos. So if you like them, please hit the like button, share my videos, and yes, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Vakil Law, Know the Law. Till then, this is me, Shivani, signing off. Bye bye.